Okay, hello everybody, thanks for coming. And I know this is a Python conference, but I'm not gonna talk about Python today. I'm gonna talk about Julia. I don't know, as a fast survey, I, should, I would like to know how many of you have heard about Julia? So everybody. And how many of you have, like, at least throw one line of code in Julia? Cool, because generally people know about Julia, but they never, like, try it, so that's pretty cool. So, okay, uh, I'm not gonna talk about Julia in general. I'm gonna talk in particular about a library that I'm developing in Julia. It's a, a multi-dimensional signal processing library, which is called shilab.jl, and he has implemented two uh, typical signal transformations that are called the wavelet transform and the shilab transform. But uh, none on, uh, like you don't need to be an expert of the wavelet or shield transform. I'm going to explain it and motivate uh, the creation of them and why it's important to have to have them implemented in a fast and high performance language like Julia. So first of all, we want to know what is our definition of signal, and this is a quite informal definition, but it's still mathematical definition of the signal. And a signal is a function or something that can be represented as a function that contains information about the behavior attributes of some phenomena. And here, the key word is it contains information. So things that contains non-information like a white noise is not a signal. It can be digital, that is discrete or analog, that is continuous. For example, this is a digital signal, and uh, discrete sample, samples of the signal will, will form a discrete or digital signal. And here is white noise, it's not a signal. So as we said, uh, signal carries information, and relevant information in the structured data is sparse. The problem is not uh, that is as far as the problem is we need to know what is the good representation system to have a sparse representation of our signal. And this representation system will be useful not just to compress the signal, to be able to, to uh, transmit it or to store it optimally, but also to get the features of the signal. Because if you get the relevant information of the signal, then you will get to know the important features that form the signal. And this is because like, relevant information will have a high correlation of its elements. For example, in this case, so our goal in signal processing is find the right dictionary or representation system to represent optimally our data. In this case, you have a vector of blue. So a good representation system will be different shades of colors and therefore the coefficients on this representation system of uh, blue, it will be the different shades of the blue. So it will be mostly zero. And that is what we call a sparse representation. So along the time, along the history, there has been different attempts to represent uh, the most general signals sparsely. The first one, the first known one, is the Fourier transform that was proposed by Joseph Fourier, a French mathematician, in 1822. And he saw that some certain functions can be optimally represented as a sum of cosine and sine functions. And the, the variable that you get with this, with this transformation will be considered as the frequency. So basically, you get all the frequencies in your, func in your function. For example, here you have a function that is just like a cosine and of course, or sum of cosine and sines, of course its representation will be quite sparse because you will just have like, for example, in this case, two frequencies. Of course, not in every case you will be able to represent optimally uh, a signal with cosines and sines, for example, signals that have like more complex frequencies. In Julia, you have uh, FFT, a fast Fourier transform uh, implementation, which is quite fast and is based in the, in the classic FFT that is also implemented in Python and in MATLAB. And in this case, for example, I'm creating uh, a function that is just sine of two pi t plus two cosine of six pi t square. Of course, this is a function that has no much, uh, not many different frequencies, and therefore, when you calculate the fast Fourier transform, which is in this case just applying the function FFT, 
you will be able to see that mostly all the elements are zero. Just three frequencies here are relevant. So therefore you can compress the signal just eliminating the other terms. And of course you can, you, you can recover the signal just applying the inverse transform, which in this case is, is performed by the function uh, EFFT, and then you get the same signal, right? Now, a Fourier transform has a lot of problems, as I said, like functions that have a lot of frequencies will not be optimally represented by a Fourier transform. And it also has no time information. So when you apply the Fourier transform, if you see here, you take the integral over, over all the time, or all over all the space, therefore you will know the frequencies, but you will never know when the frequencies happen or where the frequencies happen. And this, this property you will like to have in some applications like sound processing, when you will like to know like when these sounds happen. Of course, this, like the easiest way to tackle this problem is instead of integrating over all the time or, or over, over all the space, you take a small, uh, a small Windows functions and you take the Fourier transform in these Windows functions and then you move the Windows functions along the time or along the space. And so you will have local information about the frequencies as well. This is called the short time Fourier transform and it was, it was presented by Gabor, uh, Dennis Gabor, which is actually was in Berlin. Uh, in what before was the Technical University of Berlin. And he was presented in 1946. And the form is like that, so it's like the Fourier transform if you see, but now you have this function G, which is uh, a Windows function that you can move along the time. This can be seen as this, so you have a small, a small um, Windows functions and you get the Fourier transform in locally and then you move the Windows function. But this has problems which are more technical. One of them is like the systems generated by this transform are called, uh, this representation system is called a Gabor system. And Gabor system have uh, something that Fourier transform has as a problem that is the uncertainty principle. That is the same like in quantum mechanics. Like you will not be able to localize perfectly time and frequency at the same time, which will carry some problems in applications, of course. And also we have the problem that we don't change the size of the Windows function. The size of the Windows function is the same all the time. Therefore, you will not be able to get features that are very localized, like singularities, for example. And now, as we as we done before, that we, ne we didn't have any time information, there were, therefore we take a Windows, now we don't have different sizes information. Now, like the easiest way to tackle this problem is just change the size. And this is made by a transformation called the scaling. And just applying a scaling or changing sizes of the Windows function in the short time Fourier transform is what is called the wavelet transform. It's actually well known because it was implemented by the JPEG uh, codec. And the, the wavelet transform is just the same as the short time Fourier transform, but now you divide by uh, parameter A, which will modulate the size of the Windows function. Yeah? So you can represent this as the convolution of your function with some other function, which is your wavelet. And convolution and scaling uh, transformations are uh, operations that are well known in signal processing and in discrete time are performed by something called filtering and other thing that is called the subsampling. This is kind of like the comparison in between the short time Fourier transform and the wavelet transform. The short time Fourier transform, if you see the Windows function doesn't change and the, in the, web, the wavelet transform, the Windows function change, therefore you will be able to get very localized information like singularities. Okay, so in this library, which is called Shirlab, in, in Julia, which is already uh, is already registered as a package in, in Julia, so you can just in, uh, if you have already Julia in your in your uh, computer, you just need to to do this this line of code package .at .shirlab, and it will be installed directly in your computer. So we can call the the library just using Shirlab. 
And as I say, the wavelet transform is performed by having a Windows function, moving it, and then also scaling it to change the, the size of the Windows function. In one dimension, it's really easy because you just have, you have one direction where you will scale and you will move. In two dimensions, it's a little bit harder because now you have two directions. So in this case, you will scale in one direction, you will scale then in the other direction. Therefore, as you are scaling with the same amount of scales, then you, you will have an isotropic scaling. You, you will not have like different sizes in different directions, which in some cases is really important, but in other cases is actually a problem. So in this case, I need to generate, first of all, a filter, which will be uh, the discrete representation of our wavelet function. And then I will, I will uh, load, oh, wait, uh, yeah. So I will load an image, which is this image, it's called Barbara. It's actually a well-known image in signal processing, in image processing. And this image, of course, is, in this case, as you are in grayscales, it is uh, just a matrix of numbers, which represent the different, uh, the different intensities in each, in each point, in each pixel. So therefore, I can perform the wavelet transform, which is just subsampling and filtering, which represents scaling and, and convolution with your function. And in this case, as we just have two directions of scaling, we will just have information that is horizontal, that is vertical, and that is diagonal. Therefore, you will catch uh, edges or features in your signal that are in these, different, these three different directions. In this case, as you can see, this looks like our image, our original image, but now you would just get the horizontal information in different scales. Of course, whether more scales you take, you will have a better representation of your signal because you will have more different sizes that you will represent. In this case, it's the vertical one. In this case, it's the diagonal one. And you can get the signal, you can recover the signal by just doing the inverse, the inverse operations, which is upsampling and filtering with the inverse filter. and then you can get the signal. Of course, if you take, as I said, if you take just five, for example, five scales, five different sizes, the recovery of the signal is not so good, it's quite, quite pixeled, but then you get more scales, you get better, better recovery. Here, I'm killing some scales, therefore, the signal is compressed, but of course, you will have to, you will, you will like to have a compressed signal, but it's, that also has a good quality. And this is a trade-off that is like a lot of problems in signal processing are based. You can also say, okay, now we have different coefficients that represent different scales and different, uh, I mean, different sizes and different positions our signal on our signal. And some of these coefficients will be important and some of them will be not important. For example, if you have an image that have mostly edges that are aligned with the horizontal uh, vertex, then you will, you will just need the, the uh, coefficients that are correspondent to the horizontal uh, elements. And here you can say, okay, then I can, I can do a threshold operation which says I get a threshold and then I kill all the coefficients that are below this threshold, which is killing coefficients that are not so important. And you will have also you can do a recovery with coefficients that are important, and in this case, I'm taking a good threshold, and therefore the recovery is quite good, which gives you a signal-to-noise radio 25, which is actually pretty good. And therefore, that's why the wavelet transform is a good transform to make a compression codecs, and that's why they use it in the JPEG codec standard. Now, as I say, you are doing a scaling in both directions with the same amount, and this is a problem because you have isotropic uh, elements. You will not be able to enclose things that are not isotropic. Things that are different in different directions. And uh, wavelet transform has also 
The problem that uh, you don't change the orientation of the elements, therefore you don't have direction sensibility. And actually most of the natural images that exist in, in the world have features that have a certain direction. So you will, you will like to have direction sensibility to be able to capture them. And as we need to have a f an abstract framework to represent natural images that we would like to represent optimally. And this uh, abstract framework is called the cartoon-like functions. And the cartoon-like functions basically are just functions that are piecewise uh, smooth, that have uh, also the boundaries where they're smooth are also smooth. This can be seen as this, just like, uh, yeah, like things that can be represented by piecewise smooth, like almost every, every image that you can see can be represented as this. And um, Donohoe, uh, I think he's an American mathematician, which is pretty good signal processing, which is well known. He proved a theorem about the res representation of cartoon-like functions. Here you have something that is called sigma n, that is the best n-term approximation error, and can be understood as how the coefficients in your transformation decay. So this, the lower is the best end time approximation error, the better is your representation. And in this case, he said that if you have a frame, which is kind of a like generalization of a orthonormal basis, if you have a frame of L2, then you will be able to optimally uh, represent your frame until m to the minus one. So the coefficients associated to the system will be, will decay as fast as n to the minus one, no more, no faster. The wavelet transform has a decay, uh, decay rate of n to the minus one half, which says that it's not pretty good. You can be able to, you, you could be able theoretically to be twice faster than that. And the problem is of course that as you are doing uh, in two dimensions the same scaling in the two directions, then you just have like uh, windows functions that are like squares or rectangles and curves that are not straight lines are not well approximated by squares or rectangles. So you would like to change, elongate your windows functions and also change the orientation of your windows functions to represent these curves better. And this is what the Schirle transform does. And the Schirle transform is just like the natural generalization of the wavelet transform in the sense that you introduce a new scaling operator that change the sizes of your elements in different, in different amount in the different directions. And a shearing operator is basically just like cutting your, your elements, which changes the orientation of the elements. Here, what could say like, why do you use shearing instead of uh, rotation, which rotation is like natural, like the intuitive way to change orientation of things. But orientation has a problem when you want to implement it numerically, because when you're implementing numerically, you have like a discrete grid, and when you're rotating the discrete grid, you will not maintain the grid, of course, and this is a problem. So the Schirle transform is just the projection of your function with these windows, new windows functions that depend in three parameters, one parameter of the scale, of the size of your elements, one parameter of k that is the shearing, that is the orientation of your elements, and one parameter m that is just moving like the translation of the elements. And when you are doing that just as, like in this, in, in this sense, you will get a tiling that is a covering of the uh, Fourier domain, of the frequency domain that looks like this. And this telling is bad because if you have lines in the frequency domain or features in the frequency domain that are aligned to the, uh, to the second, to the y direction, you will need to have an uh, infinite number of shearings to cover them. So therefore, this is a problem. You will have a really biased uh, transformation in that direction. How you solve this is you divide your Fourier domain in cones and in a, in a lower, uh, frequency domain, which this is actually 
taken from the wavelet transform because in the wavelet transform what you do, what you say is if you would like to cover the whole frequency domain, you will need to do infinite number of scalings, infinite number of, of changes of size to be able to get until the zero, to be able to cover the whole frequency domain. And therefore, if you want to do a numerical implementation of it, you just have a finite number of scales. Therefore, you would like to then just patch the low frequency domain and then scale in the other, in the other uh, places. So you will have, you will divide your frequency domain in a low pass filter domain, in a low pass frequency domain, and in different cones. In these different cones, you will perform the shear led transform. There are two ways to, to there are two ways to pick this function. There is called the mother function, the shear led function. There is one way to pick it as a separable function, which is just the, tra the tensor product of, of two functions or as a non-separable function will be the separable function times something that gives you a direction, that gives you non-separability. It's better when you do it in a non-separable way because the tiling of the frequency domain does not overlap. So different elements will not overlap in the frequency domain, which, which give you a more optimal uh, cover of the frequency domain. And it's, it's proven already that the best end, end term approximation error scales and n to the minus one log n three half and log n when you are really big can be thought as a constant. Therefore you are kind of getting the optimal uh, best n term approximation error. Therefore you are getting a very good representation system for 2D signals for, for images. And therefore that's why it's really important for different signal processing tasks to be able to have this implemented in your programming language. There is actually a Python implementation of this already also. Now there are different softwares today that implement the Shillet transform. Mostly they are in MATLAB. There is one that was made in Kaiserlautern. There is one that was made in, in University of Houston, Texas by Demetrio Labate. And there is one that was made by uh, Gita Kutinyok, Juan Kulim, Rafael Reisenhofer in Theo Berlin. And the group where she's working, she's one of the creators, Gita Kutinyok is one of the creators of the Chile transform. And I'm working in her group. And the group was the one that made this Shilab 3D, which is the most used by different, uh, different universities and different institutes is the most used implementation of the Shiller transform. But it's in MATLAB, therefore MATLAB like doesn't make, uh, for me doesn't make sense to do MATLAB things for science because science should be open source and MATLAB just will let the people that have MATLAB or the license of MATLAB to do it. And it's also MATLAB has as a basic, as a basic type, it has the, uh, complex matrices, and of course it's nice to have complex matrices as your basic type, but when you're not working with complex matrices then it's a problem. So doing for loops or other kind of stuff are quite slow. There is a Python implementation of this last library, which is called PyShilab. It was made in the University of Göttingen. I haven't tried it, so I don't know how does it perform in comparison with the Julia transform, with the Julia implementation, and there is the Shilab implementation that I did in Julia, which is called shilab.jl. And why, why is uh, Julia is a nice language to do signal processing and in particular Shilab transform? First of all, Shilab transform uses an extensive use of fast Fourier transform, which is well implemented in Julia. It has also, Julia has also fast vectorization uh, options like with vectorization of functions and loops that are really fast because it implements the JIT compilation, the just-in-time compilation. Has plenty of image filtering, import and rescaling functions with two very nice libraries, yeah. image.jl and wavelets.jl, and has support of multi-threading and painless GPU processing with arrayfire.jl, which I also use. So very fast, I will show you how I did the Shilly transform. So the Shilly transform, as I, as I explained to you, I will use the same, the same image, and I have a function, okay, these are just uh, parameters for the Shilly transform. I will use four scales instead of eight scales that I use in the wavelet transform, just to show you why it's better. And uh, I have a 
two functions that generate the shielded uh, elements. That is just taking your shielded function, your mother function, and scale and, scale and shear and move it. And one is non-parallel and one is in GPU parallel. GPU parallel one is really fast. And you can see the different elements that look like, like windows that are aligned in different directions and that have different sizes, as I say. This is the windows that covers the low, the low frequency domain. And now you can get the coefficients associated with, with, your, uh, with your image because, of course, the elements are independent of the image. The elements are in general. So you can use these elements, just uh, take your image and take the convolution of the image with each of the elements, and you will get information of the image in each direction and each size. And then, for example, in this case, in the first direction, we have things that are aligned in this direction, like kind of diagonal. And then different directions, you see that the features are aligned in different directions. And you can do also, again, zooming everything up, you can get the, reco the recovery of your image. And it's actually just using four uh, scales, there is the half that I use for the Shearlet transform, the, for the wave transform, you get a very good uh, recovery. In this case, you can see this is just using four scales. And here, for the wave transform, when I use five scales, it's really bad, the recovery. Here, I use five scales, it's really, really bad. So therefore, that proves like Shearlet transform is actually better than wave transform to represent images. And now, wave, uh, I have some benchmarks of comparison with the MATLAB. Uh, library to, to, to show you why is, why is better. So MATLAB in this case is the blue line. Here is the number of pixels in each direction. And Julia is the green line. And Julia using GPU is the black line, which looks like a constant. It looks like really easily here that MATLAB is not, is not scalable for really big images. And the most, this is for the generation of the system. This is for the decomposition, that is the computation of the coefficients. And this is for the recovery, which in all of them looks like at the beginning, they perform kind of the same. And then when you get until an uh, image that is bigger than uh, 1,024 pixels square, like MATLAB just explodes and Julia is still quite scalable. Actually, the most impressive one is when you're doing the reconstruction of 1,024 times 1,024 and you're using GPU parallel computations, you have uh, that Julia is, one, is 125, 27 times better than MATLAB, which is actually quite impressive. Now, other things that you can do with this is imagine that you have a signal or an image that is noisy. Noise carries no information, therefore, if you get the Shearlet transform, the coefficients that have, uh, the, the noise will be in the coefficients that have less importance, the coefficients that are smaller. So if you kill them by thresholding, then you can denoise the function. So this is, this is an image that is noisy, you can see it. Imagine that you just have this image, you get the Shearlet coefficients, and then you kill the coefficients that are less important, the coefficients that have less, uh, less um, absolute value, let's say. And then you denoise the image, and actually the denoise is, is quite good. If you compare with the noisy one, it's quite good. Also, the noise is part of the high frequency elements, and high frequency elements are not so important in the image in general. Like, image has no like big change of sizes, big change of... of uh, yeah, of size. And, and then you can do also another application, which is kind of the most impressive one. It's called in-painting. And in-painting, what, what it does is like, imagine that you have an image, a lossy image. You have an image that has a lot of loss parts. For example, uh, the image is really old, so some of the parts fell down. And these parts can be represented as holes. And the holes are like big steps, big fall downs in the image. 
So these parts are very, very discontinuous and form part of the high frequency uh, elements in the Fourier domain. So you can use again the Fourier, the Shirley transform to cover these parts, kind of smooth out the image. And in this case, you use something that is called the iter iterative hard thresholding, which is an optimization method that is used uh, a lot in, in comfort sensing. Uh, and then imagine that you have this masked random. So it's an image that has random parts that are lost. And using the Shirley transform, I can recover the image and it looks like this, which is actually quite impressive. And then if you have, for example, a squares, you have an image that have squares that are lost. You can use again the, Fourier, the Shirley transform using the iterative hard coding that kills elements that have high frequency. You can get a recovered image like this. And well, basically, that's all the code that I would like to show. And this is, I'm using right now this to, to do a 3D recovery. You can, there is something called light field recovery or light field theory, uh, which basically is based that if you take a different pictures of a scene, let's say, different pictures are not so separated from each other, then you can stack them in, uh, in this kind of stack. And then you can follow for each, let's say, each uh, horizontal line, you can follow the points, and following the points, you get this kind of mm, this kind of uh, linear structures. So, therefore, if you want to get uh, the depth of each point, you just need to to measure the slope of the lines here, and you can recover the, the depth of each point, and therefore you can recover the three D information of the scene. And of course, you need a lot of pictures to get a good, a good recovery of the depth, but you can just do a sparse sample of the pictures, and then you will get like something like this. Instead of this, you get something like this, and you would like to in-paint using different transformation, in-paint this to recover the original picture, and using wavelets looks like this. If you use wavelets, it's really bad. So you don't see any line there, so you cannot actually compute any slope. But if you use shirlets, you can do this, and you can get a good recovery of them. And then using just a small amount of pictures, you can recover the 3D information of your scene. And basically, that's all what I want to say. Yeah. Thank you. So questions? Questions? Thanks. No questions. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I would like to ask questions about what's your opinion on um, recent advancements in deep learning and convolutional neural networks and whether uh, these methods might find uh, representations of images that would be uh, easier to work with in specific domains or would a generic uh, image decomposition using well-known functions like wavelets still will be useful? Actually, the, there is a paper about this last year came out of Bietowski and, and Bolche. I can show you the paper. And in this paper, because these deep convolution and neural networks are, were originated by Stefan Mala in 2012, I think so, and he used wavelets to do that. But now there, like, there is a paper when the, guys from the ETH Zurich, they generalize these for different frames, and then they show that shillets are part of this framework. So therefore, you can use them for deep convolution and neural networks, and you will have a good, uh, good uh, algorithms to do image recognition things, basically. So yeah, it's, it can be used, shillet transform for deep convolution and neural networks, and it's already proven. Last year was proven. The problem with these deep convolution and neural networks that are quite general is you, do, you have estimation of like in image recognition problems, you want to have sometimes like uh, translation invariance. So you would like to have to be able to recognize a dog here or a dog here, no matter where. But the, the estimates for that exist, but the, the, there doesn't exist estimates for the error of the of the feature structure of, uh, related to the deep convolution and neural network. So therefore, it's a good theory, but you don't know still 
how good are they representing the, the things, but yes. So you are all hungry probably, <laughs> hearing the noise coming. Thanks a lot, Hector. Thank you. Interesting talk.